So I guess you have uh, looked into the schedule and you have seen this uh, title with the uh, limiting side effects of application at compile time. And you probably also saw like this word called Haskell. So just so we're on the same page, or pace, sorry. Um, I will just say a little bit about myself, who I am and why I'm actually here giving this talk. How and why is it actually relevant and which benefits do we actually get about this thing about limiting the side effects of application at compile time? And as before, Adrian, I'm really thankful to see I'm not the only crazy one going around uh, releasing all my slides under this copyleft license. This is the important part, copyleft, at least from my point of view. So, as you're probably hearing, you can hear like I have this uh, Danish-English accent, right? All the Swedish will notif or no or notice. But I'm actually uh, from a mixed uh, marriage. I'm a Spaniard and also a Dane. I'm really much into theory and, uh, and everything we do. So I have a master's degree in computer science, but I also like the math, so I went for a minus in mathematics. Uh, I work for my own company, and I'm trying to um, solve in a probably elegant way all this uh, noise we got uh, the last two years with regard of the European data or general data regulation. And if you go into that URL, you will see what I'm working on. And of course, this has to be also copyleft, but I use a more permissive one because if you want to convince uh, people to use your, uh, or like companies and private companies to use your tool, sometimes you need to respect their uh, intellectual property. A lot of people say, why you love Haskell so much? So as a good hacker or as a good developer, I always have my IDs in black background and green text, right? So when I put in this like 10, min ten, I ten minutes before Adrian's talk, you couldn't see it because of the amount of light, so I have to change everything. Because uh, LibreOffice is written, I think, at Java, even though you change something to black, you can still see you have traces of green because you don't have determinism like you probably have in Haskell and all this kind of side effects. So. This is why I love Haskell. And I've been like, when we come to the table, I've been like using 10 minutes with the table alone. So I hope I got it right. Uh, I love copyleft and the guys that ensures that this copyleft actually lives up to whatever happens in our real life is, uh, is the guys from Free Software Foundation. So I've been a member from that organization for many years. I love pretty much functional uh, programming. So I have this meetup in Copenhagen and I write a lot of rants on my blog, but now I just write code. So I hope people read that instead. And this talk is going to be under the menu of talks. So just so we are on the same pace, you don't need to understand Haskell or all this complex notion or stuff there is in Haskell. But I suppose if you have a bit of notion with regard of programming, so how many people here code? That's a lot. How many people here code with statically type safe languages? Okay. 50%, nice. So like, this is a very short uh, talk. So, so what I'm trying to do here is like, I will, I will actually show what we can do with Haskell with this tool and how we can actually limit all the side effects uh, at compile time. And I will also showcase you why this is relevant for you and what benefits do you get out of it. So Haskell. You probably heard about it. Hey, we are at Shulmers, right? So, so Haskell is like a general purpose language which can be used for many things. And it comes from this paradigm of functional programming. But it differs a lot from some of the other functional programming languages is because it's uh, lazy evaluated. So we're only going to use uh, the calculation if you actually need the value with regard to others which are like strict evaluated. So it will calculate the values even though you don't use them. And of course, it's strongly typed and it's pure. I will come a bit into that one. It's been widely used in academia, but thanks to companies mm -hmm. like uh, FP Complete in San Diego and Galois in what's called Twig.io in France, many of those fancy features are actually coming to the industry, which is really, really good for us. So one of the key things about this programming language is this concept of code that produces side effects and code that doesn't. So just to uh, mention this, and, and the good thing about like uh, the people working with type safe languages, uh, you cannot put aggregate a string to an integer, right? 
it's because your compiler, your type system will say those two things don't match. So this is what Haskell do with code that has effects and code that doesn't have effects. So I made the table and I can see this work. Okay, no, no green lines anymore, cool. So how Haskell actually works is that um, as long as you have a code path with effects, you are, uh, you are able to actually call code with effects. Oh, sorry, sorry. Parent with effects. So you can call a child branch, which has effects. That's perfectly fine. The compiler will say, go for it. And you can also call pure code. But once you are in this pure world, you can call more pure code, but you can call something that is impure. Then the compiler will tell you, oh, you're actually not following the rules that I specify for you. And this, this kind of notion uh, act is actually important in the way that um, you're able to separate all the things that's easy, like mathematics, formulas for mathematics. Like when you do like addition in mathematics, you put two numbers together. That door is not closed and that door is not opening, right? So that, that concept of pure mathematics calculation is actually built into this system. So, just a second. And um, there's this like, everybody knows XKCD, right? So I have to put it there. So code, in, oh code written in Haskell is actually warranty to have no side effects, right? Because nobody would ever run it. <laughs> so I had to put it up, I had to put it up, right? So. But, but the whole point of Haskell is that in order for us to actually get some information out of our, uh, our applications, we need to ensure that at top level of Haskell, we can do all kind of effects. And I think the talk at the morning was Christopher when he was talking about Lisp. Because we build on functional uh, paradigm, lambda calculus, we don't have this concept of Turing complete uh, languages. We actually have something that is equivalent to Turing complete languages. And the person that actually showcased this back in the days was, of course, Alan Turing, who did his, uh, uh, his master thesis, no, his PhD under Alonso Church, which was one of the forefathers of uh, functional programming, or at least lambda calculus. So, so if we could not do this, like if we don't have this parent branch where we can actually say that we have all kind of effects, let's just imagine we have this application that's just pure. We run it, we cannot see what happens, and we cannot give it uh, input, right? So you just see your computer gets really, really hot, and then it stops, but you don't know what's happening, right? So it will be just a waste of time executing those applications. So the problem is, and I also get a lot of heat when I give this talks to Haskell people, because 90% of all Haskells is just like this concept of I.O. where you can do all effects, that's something they propagate around all the code branches. So, so for me, this is not like the way you should do it, right? Because just because you need to do some effects, why should you be able to do all kind of effects? So, so this is why I will try to argue about this limiti limiting the effects of your uh, applications. So my example here is send, conf send confidential data. I got a contractor in, and I want those guys to code that stuff with some effect. But how do I limit those guys not taking our sensitive data and sending them back to their own servers so they can actually sell it or get money out of it? So, so every now and then, and I would say like, um, we live in a really strange world. There was this really nice uh, package SSH decorator, which when, when, when you were working with your SSH uh, tools in, in a terminal, you got all kind of nice colors, right? And you were like, whoa, this is actually cool for me, so I can actually see which parts are which, right? The problem was this person who did this, he had this line of code where he actually took your sensitive information, password, and whatever it was, and, this, and he was sending like a copy of that to his own server. So that's not the deal for me to use your tool. Why should I give you my private information? That's not part of the deal, right? Luckily, this was open source. Somebody has used a lot of time to read all those thousand lines of code. And he said, hey, guys, do you actually see this is happening? And people are just like, oh, we probably shouldn't be using this. And you can say, yeah, this is just a rogue developer under some GitHub tag, right? What about those two guys? Do you know those two companies? Twitter and GitHub are actually logging your password from your email addresses or whatever it is, just to a file which could be accessed by all the employees or whatever it was. 
So there was like no kind of limits to be able to do this. So let's say you have a, s uh, a wonder team of 42 developers, and then you get like developer number 43, and he's actually a rogue guy. He doesn't care. He just want to get as much as information out of your system. So he's the weakest link. Your chain breaks, right? So for me, this is cybersecurity. This is what we do every day when we work with like the tools that managers tells us to work with. Yeah. So this is us. We're just there. Uh, this is completely fine. How many of you have seen like the next trip of this comic? This is us in a bit, right? Because we know that what we're doing, at some point, somebody's going to break in or somebody's going to forget to enable some configuration or the DevOps didn't do it right or whatever it is. And then we're actually really get getting the heat. And I also get a bit of uh, heat of uh, cybersecurity people and developers because I say this. And this next picture is actually true. This is my neighbor. This is actually her, uh, what is called, store uh, room back in or down in the basement. Uh, somebody broke in there. They cut it off. So she called for professionals to actually set up a new lock mechanism. I can go down with my Philips screwdriver. I can take those three out, and I can get in again. <laughs> so when we say, like, we are not professionals, there's a lot of people who aren't professionals, right? But there's not much we can do with real, uh, real world people. But when we get into the uh, uh, electronic world or IT world, we have some fancy tools that can actually help us. So we don't do uh, don't do those kind of mistakes uh, up front. <coughs> I'm good. I'm sorry. So this is one of the things that Hask is, is really really good to help us with. So I will try to uh, explain this probably a bit complex uh, concept of the prohibited M word. I will not even say it in a way that I hope most people actually understand it. So I try to do an analogy where I say that we live in those two separate worlds in Haskell. So how do we actually get from those um, uh, impure code to pure code and the pure code over to the impure code. So so this is like a bridge, right? This is how we have this notion. If I want to go to, uh, I don't know, an island, I have to go, well, sorry, if I want to go from Denmark to uh, Sweden, I probably have to go over this uh, Burson bridge. So, so, so this is like, if we just think about this, how do we go from one place to another place? Uh, if I go over the bridge with a train, I don't fall into the wall and all this thing. So we have this safe mechanism that's get us from one point to the other, right? And like this is what you can call the M, M word. So this M word, just think about it. It's like some structure where you actually represent all the calculation for your uh, for your process, which is to find some some kind of sequential step. So as soon as one of these chains stop, like it stops, like the linkage, it will actually stop uh, performing any more calculations. So it's not something that it do it in parallel, and it's not something that it's uh, going to give some non-deterministic uh, errors or non-reliable. Shouldn't be drinking uh, sparkling water. No. Sorry about that. So, so we're not going to get all this kind of uh, errors like we probably get in other programming languages. So, so this bridge is, uh, and this is something I, I got inspired from a talk at Erdev from Chris Jenkins. He was talking about PureScript, and and PureScript is something that also comes from Haskell, uh, and they have this notion when you put it on your main method. You just put like a bracket of effects that you will allow in your uh, HTML application, right? So, th so the easiest example is just to say, I actually want to render to the DOM, but I also want to print out to the console if I want to do some debugging, right? That's perfectly okay if you want to do a test or some developer instance of your application. But what if you want to uh, put it into production? Do you really want all this sensitive data getting into the log? And that kind of information from the lock can get copied by somebody else. No, you, sh you really want it to get into like the, the fields that are defined in this DOM. So, so this uh, notion that we have from uh, PureScript, it's only limited to the main uh, signature. What I'm able to do and is that I actually be able to limit also on this main method, but I can granular, I can, I cannot say granularly, limit the effects on all kind of code branches. And I can do this recursively if I want. This is the power of Haskell. 
So if we just go into this example, yeah, and we're going to show some code, finally. This is what it's all about. So another thing, I want to ensure by design, I want to make, make an application, I want to be 100% sure that what's happening in my application is actually what I'm designing, right? So we're only going to allow access to one web service or one uh, website or whatever it is. And that's, that's, we can all agree that that's an effect, right? We have to go out over the internet, we need to get some information, and then we need to get it back in some kind of uh, uh, data that we can actually work on. Then, whatever we do with that data, we need to get it on our console, because otherwise it's a waste of time. So we also need another, another uh, effect, which is display to the uh, console output, right? And, of course, Every time I access that website, maybe there are some changes. I would really like to also add a timestamp. So I access this uh, web page this morning, and I got this kind of data, and I access it afterwards, and the data probably is not there anymore. So this and C, uh, C Sharp, Java, whatever, all applications have this uh, main method, which is uh, that method that gets executed when you run the application, right? So the power of Haskell is that, and, and this the signature normally in Haskell, it has to be IO everything, which is uh, marked with the IO unit. So all application in Haskell can do all kind of uh, computation, just like equivalent to Turing complete uh, languages. But what I do here is I say, no, 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 no. I actually bind the main uh, function to a granulated function, which I, uh, limit the context of the of the effects uh, allowed in this application. So I say, I want it to have console output, access to the website, and timestamps. So now my application in Haskell can only do, do those three effects. That's it. It cannot do anything else. So this is just like the main uh, entrance of the application. And uh, for the people who know how to code Haskell, uh, this is like the thing I was saying. Uh, so so um, type classes, you can actually say that it's like interfaces in Java and in C Sharp and so like on steroids. It's, it's a very, very powerful construct. So if you just have this for, for the sake of this talk, this is like an interface, right? So I'm just saying that my interface for console out needs to be needs to have this bridge in order to communica communicate with those two uh, aisles. And I want to have some output, which I take a string, and then I just get like this uh, effect. And uh, if you just think about parentheses, parentheses is like void in most uh, programming languages, or object or imperative programming languages. So I do this. I, I want a bridge for my console. I want a bridge for my date time. And I want a bridge for my website. And that's, of course, we want TLS because we want to access uh, encrypted websites and so on. So this is like the design. I, I used to say that I know I have chosen some bad words, but this is like just to mimic uh, Haskell not or notion or sorry name convention. This is something that you can actually get business people to do because this is not really coding. This is just specifying the effects of your application. Now. As somebody who works in this company, this is the only effort I have to do. I just have to implement the instances of what I've just de designed. So this is implementation uh, details. This is the only thing I need to do. I need to ensure that the put string from Haskell gets binded to the one I defined in my uh, uh, what is a, oh sorry, uh, interface on steroids with a bridge, and so on and so forth. And then I ha uh, hard code uh, my specific website and immutability in Haskell means that you can never change this value in the lifetime of this application. So I just ensure that pass request from Haskell adds in a uh, base UR URL. So now you can only provide relative URLs. So, so that way, I know you can call all you want on this specific website, but you cannot call anything else. So we go from this all effects to a, a very small three subsets combined uh, together, right? So so it's just like, uh, where's the intersection? I don't really remember. So you can see now that I don't have to worry too much of uh, what's happening with my application because up front, I already, already know that it can only do three things. So 
this concept then, thanks to Alejandro, who pointed out to me, this is something that we call in information security and computer science a principle of least uh, privilege, or PULP in abbreviation. So, so the powerful thing about Haskell is that this is something that you see with C and sandboxes and Docker and all this stuff, but Haskell can do it at compile time. So if we don't comply with our requirements, we cannot build a, bin a binary. That's it. If you cannot build a binary, you cannot ship it. So until we don't comply with our application requirements, we're not going to ship uh, the binaries. So this is my selling point. So we design, right? Now I'm 100% sure that this application will do what I want. Now I can outsource it to anybody. I don't even care if you're the best black hack ha hacker in the world. I don't care. Either you comply 100% with my initial design, or the Haskell compiler will just say, nah, I'm not going to build. No binaries, we cannot ship the code. So you cannot inject backdoors, you cannot do anything. So let's say it's 10 million lines of code. Do you think I want to read 10 million lines of code from my uh, contract? I don't give a shit. Oh, sorry. But I don't care. I'm just going to let Haskell decide if they want to uh, allow those ten, 10 million lines of code. Hey, if those 10 million lines of code complies with what the design specifies, well, then you will get your payment and I will actually ship the application, right? And I put a little star here because you need to do some trickery in Haskell by using some compiler flex because um, you can use this really ni not nice. Well, sometimes it depends on performance, but you can actually inject something that can bypass uh, the type system in Haskell, and it's not always the side that should be that should be the case. But at least you can uh, stop it from happening. So what's relevant? Very relevant. What I say, and this is the thing. Like I say, I try to solve these uh, issues or those issues that we get with the general uh, data protection regulation from the EU. And this is taken from a blog post. This is a person who doesn't know anything about software. And he's not even a legal person. He just says that, oh, he has written also the law. And this is what he gets out of it. Oh, so we need to ensure that we minimize data. Oh, OK, if I cannot send data out from my application because it's limited, so it doesn't matter which libraries I use. I know it's not going to be leaked. We need to be able to demonstrate it. Yeah, I can sit with uh, the Swedish Data Protection Agency. Do you see these three lines of uh, design? Oh, sorry, of uh, limitation of uh, effects on the system. Yeah, that's it. It cannot do anything else. Oh, you don't trust me? Go talk with Alejandro. He'll probably say the same thing as I do. <coughs> and um, you need to use the smallest amount of data, shortest possible time. So you can say, oh, once we have get the data, we don't persist it, or we just remove it from the, from the memory. So, so like we have this really, really nice microservices, totally stateless, if you want to design it that way. And it's like, it's it's very easy to like make this uh, combination between those uh, those two processes. So so just to summarize, there's a lot of people, myself included. I love working with uh, static typing. Static typing on Haskell is static typing on on steroids as well because we can actually go a step further where we make uh, a distinction between effects and purity, right? Restricted effects. It is really really powerful. Why would I allow the application doing anything? And before uh, taking my uh, going to university, I was working as a net network specialist, right? The whole key point of that was uh, exclusion. If you can exclude as many things as possible, we knew that the domain was becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, and we didn't have to do too much uh, file, fi file finding when, when there was something wrong. Cybersecurity, all your data leaks are belonging to us if it's if you understand that refer reference. <laughs> Pulp at compile time. Yes, everything that's compile time, we love it. Outsource and design, I can always uh, showcase that what I wanted with this application is happening. Hey, if I'm actually trying to misuse people's trust, that's going to show up as well. Outsourcing, I don't care. I give it to everybody, and I will not say that S word again, sorry. So. EU, EU GDPR has this concept of a uh, data protection by design and default, Article 25, which was previously known like more vaguely as privacy by design. So by using this kind of technique or approaches, it's very easy for us to argue that we actually do in the state of the art software that actually complies with this. 
And I think I probably have one minute or two to some Q&A. Okay. So anybody has question except Klondike? I'm going to say subclass because I don't know the right Haskell word for it. But can you subclass a, a string type to be an unloggable string? Uh, so, so this concept, just for the easiness of the eyes, this could actually be instantiated in a misbehaved way. But if I uh, add proxy in intermediate proxy class between the definition of this, you cannot instantiate it. So you have to work with my way of uh, defining. But I didn't want to get too much noise. I wanted to get it like on a level so everybody can understand it. Thanks. Any more questions? No, that was it. Thanks. Thanks.